to start, I'd like to welcome Sue and Lebohan. Thank you so much for being here today, and I'm really excited to be guiding you through this conversation. Um, and also congratulations, because the book truly is wonderful. So I'm really excited to kind of dip into it and deconstruct um, what we find within it. By way of introduction, Lebohan Khanye was born in South Africa and lives and works in Johannesburg. Sorry, in Kaiserholm, South Africa, and lives and works in Johannesburg. She completed the advanced photography program at the Market Photo Workshop in 2011. Primarily known for her photography, Khanye's practice, which often incorporates archival and performative elements, centers around storytelling and uh, memory as it plays out in the familial experience. She has explored her own ongoing interest in materiality, particularly the materiality of photography in a number of ways. And this includes through sculpture, performance, as well as the moving image. In 2022, Hanya was um, selected as one of the three leading contemporary artists to represent South Africa in the 59th Venice Biennale. Sue Williamson was born in the UK and immigrated with her family to South Africa when she was seven. Today she's based in Cape Town. Her practice engages with social issues, memory, and the long-term effects of a birth date. She trained as a printmaker at the Art Students League of New York and at the Michaela School of Fine Art at the University of Cape Town. Her works um, she works in various mediums, including photography, video, and mixed media installation. Her works are held in public collections, including those at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, Tate Modern in London, as well as the Centre Pompidou in Paris. She's also known for her writing on art, uh, on art um, and also founding um, the publication Art Spot. Welcome, Sue. Welcome, Lebo. So to begin the conversation, I'd like you to maybe give us context by reading um, some of your dialogue um, of how this project came about. So just to kind of take us through um, how you two began having a conversation. Thank you, Nkopa Leng, and thank, welcome to everybody. It's really great to see you all here. Um, and yes, yeah, so one of the chapters in this book is a conversation between Lebo and myself. We met in my studio and we hadn't actually met before. That was the first time. And Lebo just comes straight from the airport and she was kind enough to detour and we had this very good conversation. So it's been edited a bit and we talked more over Zoom. So it took place over a period of time, but I think it is interesting for the way that it dissects how the, the exhibition came about and how we unpacked what we were looking at. So I'm just going to start by saying, I'm going to read a bit and then Lebo's going to read her bit. So it's going to be like a play reading. So perhaps we can start with the idea of the intergenerational conversation. Beyond the fact that the intergenerational conversation um, is there within both our works, there's the idea that the exhibition places us in conversation. This question of proximity has been playing in my head closer to this exhibition happening. As I think about our two voices, either alongside or in conversation or in contrast to each other. I'm interested in how you see our work speaking to each other. I had a conversation with Emma Lewis, the curator, about how she conceived this exhibition and how she arrived at the point of putting us together. But I think that until now, you and I have never really had a conversation about around the exhibition, around familiarity with each other's practices. I want to unpack your works as I'm unpacking my own practice right now, and to think about what it means to show our works, our works alongside one another. These are the questions that I'm asking myself. I don't know if you have anything that comes up as I'm talking. Well, we're both women artists from South Africa who work in photography, video, and mixed media, but I'm more than twice your age, and those facts already suggest the possibility of a good conversation between our work within an exhibition context, particularly because we started our artistic lives in two very different South Africas, 
me in the 1970s under apartheid and all that that meant, and you in a post-apartheid South Africa, which has had a democratic government for 20 years. And then I go on to explain a bit about South Africa then, because, of course, this is written for an American audience. Not that South Africa is in any way perfect today, but the difference between now and then is huge. Apartheid dictated which area you could live in, which school or university you could go to, which hospital would take you in an emergency, which jobs were available to you. Society was structured so that white South Africans got the best of everything, and people who dissented were put under surveillance, harassed, and sometimes forced into exile, jailed, or killed for their, pol their political beliefs. All that affected my generation of artists deeply, and we believed that as artists, we had a social responsibility to be part of the struggle for liberation and as activists to join human rights organizations, support community protest actions, march, confront the police, print subversive posters, and get them out on the street. Our studio work also needed to challenge the apartheid state in some way, and I think that it did contribute to change when change finally came. Before I became an artist, I was a journalist, so I wrote about that area and those artists in Resistance Art in South Africa, which was published in 1989. My own work at that time is a series of portrait prints of courageous women in the struggle, a few South Africans. And there were photo etchings and mixed media works with backgrounds and screen printed borders that suggested more about each person's story. And because this was long before the internet allowed us to send images around the world in seconds, I later made postcards of the series with brief histories on the back because I wanted the images of these important and brave women and their stories to be available to everyone. And then I went on to talk about, I made some on camera and I'm going to cut now and say, these are oral histories, if you like, on camera, talking about the videos. And then, I, then, then it's you, Lebo. I think that the link um, between our art practices, oral histories, and how they translate into photography. Um, you mentioned that you come from a journalistic background, which I didn't know before. That's interesting for me, because I actually applied to study journalism and got rejected. Um, I ended up studying photography at the Market Photo Workshop, which was just meant to be something, which was just meant to be something I do for a year. Um, and then I'd go and reapply for journalism. A few months before I was rejected to study journalism, when I was in matric in preparation for an English exam, I was reading a comprehension test about, comprehension test about the life and death of photojournalist named Kevin Carter. So that's actually how I found out about the Bang Bang Club. This was the first time I'd heard the term photojournalism when I was 18. I spent two years at the Market Photo Workshop, then went on to do my undergrad studies in fine arts at the University of Johannesburg. Currently, I'm snailing my way through the Masters of Arts program at the Witzwatersrand. But in retrospect, it's not that I was actually interested in journalism, but because I'm, because I'm not actually into current affairs. <laughs> I was interested in writing, and I didn't know that you could have a degree in African literature or creative writing, but that's really what I wanted to do, to be a writer or a storyteller, rather. Um, and when I approach my work, that's part of it, storytelling and narrating and also this idea of fantasy within history or within memory. It's about imaginary. The works that I'm showing alongside yours, Sue, to a large degree are about a sort of family narrative, but I'm still reimagining them. This is very different, I think, from how you approach this idea of recording oral histories, or histories as people recall them, or how people are affected by certain aspects of history. Yes, it's different for you because you work with family and you play a role within your work around the family. For me, this journey of recording my family history started at a very personal point um, after the passing of my mother. To try to locate my family, to try to locate myself within the family narrative or in the family history, probably even to draw closer to family on this journey to be able to relate to them in ways that were not as important before the passing of my mother. This interest in my family history has created a closeness that I would not have had. It's allowed me to get close with family members that I would have otherwise just met at a funeral. I was always curious about whether 
there is an opportunity for closeness with the people that you engage with or have conversations with. I suppose it's different for me. It's also part of that conversation. I'm also part of that conversation because it's my family's conversation. Well, I was really glad that Lebo asked that question because it is one that comes a lot when people are talking about my work. And so I respond, for me, closeness sometimes grows out of collaboration and common purpose. In the All Our Mothers series of photographs, which is in this show, the earliest photograph dates from 1981, and it's of Naz Ibrahim. Naz and I were both members of the Women's Movement for Peace and also of the Friends of District 6. And as you know, District 6 was a mixed race area near the center of Cape Town, a very vibrant, close-knit community of around 60,000 people. Rows of cottages and some beautiful old Victorian buildings, cinema shops, a fish market, and a public warehouse. And in the 60s, the apartheid government announced in the future the area was going to be for whites only. I was spending a lot of time at Naz's house, in Manly, which was Manly Villa, because not only were we planning the next move in the effort to try to stop this, but I was also making an installation of rubble from the demolition sites, which would be placed in a gallery and surrounded by six of Naz's dining room chairs draped in white and called The Last Supper. So, yeah, that period is documented in the photo work Last Supper at Manly Villa, and also my recent installation, The Lost District, which is also written about in this book. Perhaps we can also talk about how we start new work. I'd love to hear about these new works of yours, the very last. Are we supposed to be reading as far as this? I think we can, think yeah, we can come back to the new works. <laughs> Can I have the mic? Sorry, we have to keep moving the mics in between. Um, but I think that's such a good foundation because it kind of brings together how both of your practices are about storytelling and historicization, remaking the archive, but also deeply, deeply intimate. You know, it's always about kind of the personal story and the personal history that comes across Lewu personally with your family. Um, and Sue with kind of all of these people that you have met um, and whose lives have basically impacted your practice. Um, but what I wanted to ask you is maybe we can kind of give the audience context into um, the exhibition that led to this dialogue and that led to this conversation. Sue Williamson and Lebu Hankhanye, tell me what you remember. So obviously this question of memory is evoked specifically from the title, but maybe you can kind of give us context as to what this exhibition was, where it was staged, and why you felt um, that it was important to tell what you remember. Well, <clears throat> the curator of the show was Emma Lewis. Emma Lewis was a young curator of the Tate Modern in London and she had been invited by the director of exhibitions at the Barnes Foundation to curate something, a lens-based work, basically. And um, being a feminist and interested in women photographers, this is, she came up with the idea of, I think it, perhaps she started with thinking about me and wondering about somebody that I could work with, and, came, and she was very, very interested in Lebo's work as well. And so that's how it started. And the Barnes Foundation is quite an extraordinary institution. It's in the Philadelphia, which is one of the largest cities in America quite a, with quite a troubled history. And Barnes himself was this American businessman who in the 1920s went across to Paris and put together this extraordinary collection of Impressionist works and took them back with him to America and set up a, a private museum in his own garden, which he wanted to educate people from all walks of life. But it was a private museum. And when he died, it was not quite clear in his will what was going to happen to this collection. And eventually the city got the collection, moved to the center of Philadelphia, and they had, part of the will was that they had to reconstruct this museum room for room, meter by meter, window by window, exactly as it had been in his original museum. And they also had to hang everything, all his works, and this included 161 Renoirs, about 64 Cezannes, etc., etc., an enormous collection of one of the largest Impressionist collections in the world. And they had to hang them exactly the same way that he had hung them originally. And also, he had this collection of French ironwork. So there were little teapots and hinges and 
all sorts of things, the works is hang salon style. And in the front of this museum, they built these contemporary exhibition spaces. And the, the contemporary part has only been open since 2019. And Lebo and I were the first artists from Africa who had been invited to exhibit there. So it was pretty exciting for us. And the museum had a very thorough program which was supporting it and there were special evenings and talks. It got an enormous amount of publicity. So I think really it was, I think it was considered very successful. What? Um, so I think I, myself and Sue had only been in one other exhibition together, if I'm not mistaken, in Denmark. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Odense? No, I wasn't on that exhibition. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm, 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 then I've got the bad memory. But, no, um, no, no, it was actually in France. Okay. At, in yes. La Havre. It was yes, that La Havre. Yes. You're right. There was, we were together on an um, exhibition. So we had only met once, and I think right. that was 2017. Yeah. Um, and so when, um, when Emma, when I met Emma in 20. 2019, um, at a conference that Tate was was um, at, at a conference at Tate that she was she was part of the organizers of. Um, I was presenting a paper that was specific to um, photography and oral histories, and so my conversation with Emma really started at that point. Um, it started at a point when I was thinking about how. Um, how my practice has really been founded on um, on oral histories and sort of thinking through um, this idea of the grand narrative versus um, the stories that are shared from my families, particularly um, you know how our names come about, um, particularly is um, Tagazelo and language and um, and the sort of passing down of of names or the passing down of family stories um, through orature. And, and so I presented that paper at the time and we then, you know, and then she, she spoke to me about this exhibition that she had been invited to, um, to do at the Barnes, um, even though she was at the Tate at the time. And, um, and I just, you know, I think because me and Sue had only been in one other show together, and so it, for me it had a lot to do also with familiarizing myself with, um, with her work. Um, but also because at that point I was thinking about um, my practice and, um, and some of the thematics that I'd been working on over the last sort of 10 years. Um, and so, you know, I'd never been in a two-person exhibition. And so that for me was also um, a point of consideration about what it means for two artists to be placed um, in such close proximity um, and their practices. Um, and also because my work, at, similar to Sue's, has, um, have both been very much about this intergenerational conversation, just in two very different ways. Um, and now the exhibition together would sort of continue that by being two different artists that come from very different generations, um, you know, working with photography and with other mediums, but also very much centered on storytelling and, um, and oral history. And so that's really how um, the exhibition came about um, or started. I mean, I think that's so much more sort of, we expanded on many things because the exhibition actually took two or three years um, because the conversation started in 2019, 2020, and the exhibition only happened this year, um, 2023 in March. And so it's been, you know, it's sort of been a long time coming, um, also because of COVID, but it also allowed us to, um, to be able to produce this catalog really thoughtfully because we had so much time for conversation. Um, yeah. I don't know if I missed anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the things that's really special about this catalog is that it is kind of this feminist labor, like deeply, deeply feminist labor in the sense that the people who are involved in it are all women, uh, which is incredible, you know, from kind of the essays, um, and like you're saying, um, cu the curator Emma Lewis, who kind of championed the whole project. So that feels really special. But then there's also this question of the fact that um, a lot of South African audiences wouldn't have seen the exhibition. And so it's quite nice to bring something back home to be able to have that tactility and texture to kind of hold it and still have conversations around it. 
um, which then leads me to my next question. So I want us to maybe talk through how this work was received and how it was read within um, the American context, because obviously both of your practices are deeply local um, in terms of kind of where the stories are coming from and the issues that it's addressing. So how, how did the audience kind of receive this work? It's always difficult when you ask how an audience receives the work because you actually often don't know. Mm. You know, people seem polite and enthusiastic and we certainly had a lot of people coming. I know that one of the education officers had had a group of children who said how much they had absolutely loved Lebo's installation. Do you remember that Lebo? And um, how popular it had been with them. The children had really responded. It was one. Would you want, would you want to talk about that? That particular one. I mean, I'll, I'll expand on it, but you okay. can proceed. Um, but we had an enormous amount of publicity over the show. Yeah. There's, um, I mean, one can look it up if you want to, but we really were very gratified, I think, by the reception it got. I think some of it was quite hard for American audiences to take because, you know, we, South Africans don't really hold back. And some of the work was quite tough. Um, yeah, I, I, it's hard to say how it was received, but I think it got a lot of critical attention. I mean, I think the, um, so both, so Emma is based in the UK, um, so it's also, she's, so she's not, she's not necessarily American, and we're based in South Africa, and the work is about South Africa, and the sort of history of South Africa, or sort of thinking through the history of South Africa. Um, and, you know, and so I think a lot of it was educational, um, to a large degree, um, and I mean, obviously, I think for, for both myself and Sue, and perhaps, uh, let me speak more for myself, um, you know, I am always sort of contesting the fact that my work is deeply about South Africa. It's, it's very much about language and the sort of erasures of languages and of, of names. Um, and the work half the time is not shown in South Africa. Um, and so this for me was a show that we very much were hoping we'd be able to travel back to, to South Africa. I mean, there's still the opportunity for that. Um, but in terms of how it was received in the US, it was great. I think that there were, um, it was more educational, I think, more than anything. But there is still, I think, the desire for it to come to, to South Africa. Um, but I mean, the book, I think, provides, um, provides the audience that was not able to see it, I think, with um, perhaps even does a better job than actually seeing the exhibition. Um, and what I would like to say, too, is that although, of course, the work was about South Africa, we'd what we were, I think we were both trying to convey through our work is the importance of telling stories within families and the opening up of dialogue between the generations. Because of course, many of the situations were specific to South Africa, but there's trauma in every family in every country. I mean, you just have to look at the tensions in America to see how traumatic many of the communities, and especially in big cities like Philadelphia were. So that I think there was a hope that there would be that perhaps people would feel empowered to ask more questions with their own fam within their own families and think about that a bit, so that it wasn't just seen as a history lesson about South Africa. That's not what it was supposed to be. Okay, so just picking up on that, this notion of storytelling and oral oral histories. I'm going to read a little snippet from Portia's incredible essay, which is titled Inside the Lighthouse, Lebo Khanghanyes Dipina Zakhanya. Um, and of course, maybe Lebo, you can speak um, much more directly about, you know, the connection between light and your name. Uh, so I'll just kind of read and then you can maybe respond to that. Portia writes, sound, on, sound and orality have always informed Khanya's practice. This influence surpasses her engagement with video, effortlessly seeping into her two-dimensional photographs and more recently textiles, which are loud with sonic metaphors, aiding her exploration of history, memory, and healing work. In Lefalaka, her story and Lefalaka, her story, 
The artist signals a form of ventriloquism where her body acts as an agent through which her family histories are explored and articulated. In the role of ventriloquist, she vocalizes and amplifies, amplifies the voice of her ancestors and other family members in arresting ways, becoming both the performer and the object through which they are heard. So I was wondering if you could maybe respond to this question of amplifying the voices of the ancestors and then touching on the question of light as well. Um, I don't know if many people in the audience had the opportunity to attend the BMW Art Generation last week. Um, and for those that didn't, unfortunately, um, the work has, is no longer up. Um, but the work that Portia writes about in the book um, is Dibina Zakhanya. And it's a three channel um, film installation that we screened at the Center for the Less Good Idea a week ago. And, um, and it's basically me researching my family name. So the, how, I, how I started the family research was very much looking at the, as, at the name and what the name means and the history of the name, but also the history of names in general. Um, but also looking at clan names and the history of clan names within South Africa and what, um, why clan names were necessary. Um, uh, the recording of clan names, particularly um, the recording of this praise poem that is a record of the names, but also um, has fictive qualities, but also is a, 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 a almost, um, it's, it's a song or like a, it's, it's got like performative aspects to it. So I, so I had done, I'd been doing this research about our surname Khanye, which means light. And so in this, with this research, this light element is always part of the work somehow. And so with this, um, with this film, I then started to research female lighthouse keepers um, and looking at, um, looking at myself almost as doing the work of a female lighthouse keeper in trying to keep um, carry on this family name or take care of the family um, or take care of the family name um, by trying to preserve um, the family history. And so, and so this is what the conversation with Portia was basically, basically touching on. So it was touching on this continuation of these stories that my family tells me that I then transcribe and I then continue. Um, and in the film, what you hear is um, is me saying these clan names um, as I'm cleaning this this light bulb um, and therefore taking care of um, the lighthouse, but therefore taking care of the family name. That's really wonderful. It just reminds me of something that you pointed out yesterday, Sue, in our conversation um, in Cindy, where Magona's text, um, where she speaks about telling the tale but not necessarily owning it and that's something that comes across in both of your practices this deep commitment to continue to tell the story but also understanding that you don't necessarily own that story either it comes from other people or it comes from your ancestors moving through you um, but one question that I had um, and I remember when I was writing the essay for your work Sue one of the things that troubled me was that this is actually really difficult work, right? It's like quite difficult to engage, to think about, to give energy to. Um, and so I guess one of the questions that kept on running through my mind is like, what keeps the work going? What, what kind of is the impulse to say, this work needs to be done? Because it's not easy. Well, I suppose it comes out of working as an artist in the apartheid era, in the 70s and the 80s. That particular conference in 1981 in Botswana, the kind of, of, um, the, of social, it, I'm just trying to think exactly what the title was, but it was about social culture and social development in South Africa, where the message was, you have a social responsibility. If you live in a country like South Africa, which is basically radically unjust, you have a responsibility as an artist to see what you can do to change it. And it's your responsibility to work on the ground, to help organizations, to bear witness, and also to, um, yeah, to bear witness. And that's what I took it as. It's always difficult to tell other people's stories. 
because you're very, you don't want to, you want to represent them in a way that they would like to be represented, that they feel is, is a, a good representation of them. And it's always something that's troubled me. But at the same time, I think it is, if I hadn't done it, there wouldn't be that body of work of images of women. And um, it still comes up as a criticism. But I think that it was important to do it. And I just have to say, well, yes, it's not always easy to write about other people. In fact, most of the women that I worked with were women that I was working with in organizations. Not always, but mostly. So, yeah. I mean, I think for me, starting the conversation, I, start, so I started the conversation with my grandmother. So the research really started, started with her in order to understand how my family had, had moved around South Africa and why they um, were living in different parts of the country, how they'd ended up there, why the name was spelt in three or four different ways. Um, and so, you know, and so I think after many conversations with her, it, it really dawned on me that the conversation needed to expand beyond the two of us. Um, and, you know, and so I then began the journey of traveling around the country to try and locate family members that I'd never met before. Um, and try and get to, you know, this research around the family name or the family history and record that. Um, but I mean, to a large degree, the work the work is a record of both memory and fiction because I'm also inserting myself um, in a moment that I was either not born in yet um, in a history that I was not necessarily a part of. Um, and so I'm imagining all of that through these stories that they're narrating to me. And so the work, and that's why I think the work, I, I, the work is very cl closely tied to imaginary because there's the part of me sort of imagining all of these characters because a lot of them were also you know, they'd passed away before I was born. And so the story becomes about, um, you know, it becomes about the family story that I was not necessarily um, a part of. Um, but that also helps me understand, you know, South Africa, the, you know, the um, broken family structures within South Africa and how that took place. Um, and so that's why, for me, the story be is beyond my family story because it sort of helped me understand, I think, um, you know, life in the townships um, and why life is the way it is, I think, in the townships. Um, I've spoken it and I spoke of it as also really, really important because then it allows other possibilities for what could potentially be tomorrow. Um, we're nearing the end of our conversation, but before I ask the final question, I just want to read a little bit from the essay that I wrote. Um, and this will guide us into the next question and then we'll open it up to the floor. So um, in his book, Coloniality of Power in Post-Colonial Africa, Myths of Decolonization, historian and epistemologist Sabelo Gacheni Nlovu argues that democracy cannot necessarily be equated with liberation and points to the ways in which the achievement of democracy can instead be a hallowed, a hallowed out experience lacking in actual change. Through this reading, democracy is merely on the lives of the masses. When Buthe Bezwe, who you document in your work, Sue, asks, what is this thing called freedom that we do not have access to? She's pointing to this sense of disillusion disillusionment that is experienced by many young South Africans. This resonates with what psychoanalyst, psychoanalyst scholar Jacqueline Rose um, writes about um, with idea of the born freeze. She talks about the born free as a meaningless form of free, quote unquote free, by constitution and by law, yet still experiencing discrimination that calls into question the conditions of freedom. And I guess with that reading, my final question is, why do you feel that this work is still relevant today? What is kind of the, the work of reading about date, thinking about about date, decontextualizing it, visualizing it? Um, yeah, wh why are we still here, basically? I think it's really a very simple answer. I don't think that you can really understand your own position in the world, your family's position in the world, if you don't know what has gone before. 
you need to know the history of this country to be able to begin to interpret and, and, and find for yourself the way that you can live today and what it is that you want and how that history is impacted on you and what you can do to work against that impact. If you don't know what it was, then you know, you, you, it's like, imagine if you just lost your memory. We've got to have an, an, a historical memory of what went on in order to move forwards as individuals. Um, I mean, for me, I think the, my practice is really largely centered on, on healing. Um, and so, you know, this idea of looking back in order to, um, to be able to heal, um, but also, you know, the work really also starts with me questioning this idea of language. Um, and so language is really a huge part of it. Um, you know, the, I think for me, the, the sort of trauma of not being able to fluently speak my language, um, having been denied that, um, is also why, you know, I, I sort of keep going back to these recordings with family members, these recordings. And I mean, what you, what I, what I keep hearing, even as I play back, is how much of, of it I sort of really need to, um, to make sense of. Because, you know, because they also come from a generation where they speak, they speak fluent Sotho. Um, and so I think it's also for me a large part of it about reconciling. Um, reconciling all of these these traumas, I think, for myself. But um, but it's also, I think, for me to be able to make certain decisions um, for myself, for my for my children. I think, as is the case for all of us, um, I think it is important to sort of understand um, what we lost or what was taken from us um, and how to reconcile that. Thank you so much for grounding us and for um, kind of taking us through your practices and answering all of these difficult questions. Um, I'm going to open it up to the floor now. We've got, um, yeah, roughly 15 to 20 minutes, so there's sufficient time for people to ask. Um, it can also be an offering in terms of a comment. You're going to have to come closer, Pumlani. Yes. Oh. Hi everyone. Yeah, uh, my name is Brian. Um, yeah, I think I'm more interested in the question of like naming. Um, I'm thinking of things like uh, artists, actually, whether we're looking at maps or maybe diversity of practice. So, artist as a curator or artist as a historian. So, I feel like maybe the conversation kind of gravitates into like history, and I'm interested to kind of uh, learn or how if then we to are kind of comfortable with these kind of like titles or naming of you know, things like the base of how some of the history and things like that and how they position their practices in relation to that. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing that um, well, you can keep where we started reading um, in the book was the sort of discovery that. Sue comes from a journalistic background, and I had wanted to study journalism. Um, and so I think even as, you know, as we practice, there is that point of research. I think, I think my, both our practices are very much centered on research and going out and speaking to other people um, in order to sort of transmit this, this story. And, you know, and so for me, I think I always think of my practice beyond photography. And that's why I, I, we start by speaking about how I, how I actually end up studying photography. Um, but I don't call myself photographer. Um, I mean, I very much respect the medium, um, but I don't call myself photographer. I rather call myself a storyteller because I, it, it feels like it encapsulates so much. Um, be it the performance aspect of my practice, be it the, you know, continuing a story that I've been told. Um, so, yeah, so storytelling for me seems more fitting because it brings in all of these other, you know, all of these other skills that I, that I, that I have. Yeah, I think also when Lebo and I were talking, I asked Lebo if she thought of herself as a photographer and she said that she didn't. She thought of herself as an artist who uses photography when she needs it. And I feel exactly the same. I don't, I would never describe myself as a photographer. I take a photo if I have to, but it's just one of many media that's available to us as artists. And 
Yeah, these fixated terms that you were talking about, curator, artist, artist, historian, I think they're all rather fluid today. You do, one does a little bit of everything. I don't really see myself as fitting in a particular box. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Please question me, let's see. <laughs> Do you find that your art forms work in um, splitable? I ask this question purely because when I talk to people that's around to the one's work and that I'm interested or I love it or anything like this, a lot of people are like, it's hard to understand. What does it mean? Do you find that it is a black work in your art versus Palatable, do you find that the people that are engaged are people who are in love with the arts, really educated in the arts, in the arts? So, not really for somebody who is learning or getting into the art forms. No, I've put that nicely. Um. <laughs> you can start though. Well, I'm just wondering, uh, I'm not quite sure what the question do, do we do, do, do I find that people find it hard to understand my work? Uh, I try to make work that actually will be quite easily understandable, but usually you do need to know a little bit about what the subject of what I'm writing about. I mean, I could even take, for example, there's a work on the Goodman stand now, which is a storyboard work, which led to, which was part of a, another project I made called um, it's a pleasure to meet you, which was a video conversation. And in this work, Dan says it's a storyboard, and you see Candy's mama, who was one of the um, subjects of the, one of the people who took part in the video. And she's standing in front of a bridge, and you see this combi coming towards her from the back. And she's repeat, she and her family went to visit Eugene de Kock in jail because he had killed her father. And they went to visit him in jail when he was seeking, um, when he wanted to come out on bail. And the family was asked, the National Prosecuting Association asked, do you want to visit him? And they said, yes, we want to hear from him, what he did, why did he do it? So these little fragments of conversation are things that came out of that conversation. So if you didn't know that whole background, yes, it would be, you'd have to look it up a bit. But I do try to, I don't try to make it, well, I hope that people will be interested enough in it to perhaps try and find out a bit more. But I don't want to make something that's, it's not an ABC either, if I can put it that way. Um, I mean, I think for artists that also engage with so much research, um, that not all of it will be in the work. I mean, I think for, I'm just trying, so for example, with the recordings or the conversations that I have with, with my family, a lot of that isn't in the work. Um, so it allows me to imagine the story. So for example, the, the, my grandfather being the first one to move to the city, I, you know, I, I'd never met him, I only had photos of him, um, and in all of these photos he was always wearing a suit. And so all of these stories that they were telling me about my grandfather, I, I sort of Im imagined them, and then I wore a suit similar to the one that he's always wearing in these photos, and then reenacted these stories and created um, a set in my studio, of these life-size cardboard cutouts, and then I performed as him, um, you know, reenacting these stories that they told me. And so you would not know this whole story behind it. You would, you would see me, like the first one, you would see me in the suit with all of the different family members behind me and the cityscape. So this is basically him almost leading the family um, to the city because he refused to, to be a farm laborer like the, the rest of the family. And so you wouldn't know all of this background story and how the different people narrated it to me. Um, and and I don't and I and I don't know if that needs to change. You know, I think that the that the research is a, is a big part of me imagining the work that I then create. But I don't think it needs to necessarily be. I don't know. I, like I don't know. I, I think similar to Sue, where I have to say this happened for this to happen. Um, I mean, I think also there's works that are much more um, simple. I mean, there's the diorama works where 
honestly, I, you know, there's all of the research behind it about the lighthouse keepers and the history of lighthouse keeping in South Africa. Um, and without the recordings, it, it's really difficult for you to really get into that history. And I think that's why publications are so important. I think they're so important for an artist um, to be able to really give you all of the background, I think, behind it. And also to have thinkers and writers and curators engage with that artist practice, um, I think, as we're doing. So that, you know, even the difficult questions, what I've not thought about, what, about what the work is doing or is not able to do, that, you know, that can sort of come out through the conversation conversations with the curators or, or writers. Um, and that's why I think that for those that are able to get this publication, um, that it takes on a journey, I think, about both our practices um, alongside each other, but also separately that I don't think, um, yeah, that I don't think I've been able to do before or have done before. Also because the exhibition was sort of three years in the making. And so there was so much that I think we were able to reflect on over the three years about our practices, but, but also about things that we weren't seeing in our practices. Um, yeah. Um, I'm just curious if the work that was on the exhibition was all old work or if it was if work was made for the exhibition and if if new work um, were your conversations influential in the new work that was made <laughs> um, so on my end um, and I think similar to Sue because I remember Sue actually arriving with with um, a, a, a print <laughs> that I think she was still finishing off. Um, so, so there's works that um, from my end are some of the earliest works, so 20 works from 2023, which is the works about my mother and then leading up to works that I then, you know, produced from, you know, from 2019 when the, the conversation started up until 2023 20, when, when we had sort of, when the exhibition took place. Um, and I mean, there's works that we had initially thought of or when we initially started the conversations, which had been a selection for the exhibition, which never actually entered the exhibition um, and were sort of swapped out with other works or swapped out with newer works or other works that, you know, that sort of came in, I think, from both sides um, because of how the conversation was also taking shape. But I didn't make work specifically for, for the exhibition. I think there were works that were in the making because um, as I said, when I met with Emma in 2019, I just started my MA, and so I was really thinking through um, oral history and thinking about the family photo album um, and, you know, and its sort of function. And so the works that then also later entered the exhibition were really works that I was, um, that I felt were, were thinking, were sort of going deeper into the earlier works that I'd not had the space or given myself the opportunity to really um, reflect on. I made, I ha did two new photographs in a series that I'd been making of women and I made, as Debo said, I arrived with one print which I'd literally finished the night before, which was a follow-up to the one that's downstairs, the storyboard work on the Goodman stand. I did one of, of Sia Mgaduka, who was the other person in this conversation. Yeah, but basically an exhibition like that is not really about new work, it's more about, it's more of a survey so that although you change as you go along or you alter things a bit, it's, it's, a, long, it's a story that's gone on before. Uh, gosh, lots of questions. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, you both spoke really beautifully about the importance of history and research in your work. And I'm curious to know about how you think about art history. So thinking about how the Barnes is home to many canonical Western artworks, but then also thinking about the many art histories on the African continent and then in South Africa. Um, I think, well, I feel about art history as, as all histories, I think it's very important to see what has happened before, what's gone on over the years. Certainly African art history has not been documented in very much depth at all. When you consider what has happened, you, you know, what an enormous body of work there has been on the Western canon. Um, I think that's beginning to change a bit. But I do think that, we, 
Uh, certainly in the universities here, I don't think there's much taught about African art. Is there? <laughs> no, I, I think uh, I it mean, is changing. Yeah. yeah. Doing an incredible work at reimagining the curriculum to bring those stories about. So it's slowly changing. It is yeah. changing. Yeah. I don't know if you want to add anything. <laughs> um, I mean, I think what what I can add was the was the importance I think of having. Um, for example, Portia, um, Cindy Wen, Hopoling as the contributors yeah. um, to this process, um, which you know I think as sort of thinkers, writers, but also you know black female um, writers and thinkers or historians. Um, I think that was important for both myself and Sue and the curator, um, and I think also because you know also because working with the curator Emma, um, there was also I think a lot of learning from from her part as well, um, you know, also not being from South Africa. And you know, and so I think having these other three three writers or three contributors that um, that are from South Africa was was important. Yes. Okay. Ah okay. <laughs> well, okay, but Hi, I just wanted to ask. So, the art world is like a bit gatekept sometimes, and I've always wondered, like, how do you take your art to the world stage when it seems like there's so many barriers to just getting your spot? So the question is, how do you take it to world stage? I, all I can say to young artists is really just keep working. Just believe in what you're doing. Just keep doing it. Don't give up. Just work and work. And you'll get there. Somebody's going to notice your work. You'll put it on the Johannesburg Art Fair, and somebody will come by and say, hey, that looks interesting. Where's the artist? So I personally believe in a in a holistic practice. Um, so I believe in the sort of writing about your work. I believe in the research, um, in you doing the proposals. Um, so all of those things, the art administration, all of it. So I think that even at a point where you have an establishment or an institution that is backing you and that is doing um, the administration for you and the sort of commercial side for you, but I do think that it is important that young artists actually do all of that sort of research in the writing and um, and less so, not less so, but I think the, the idea of like networking, it's good, but I really think that grounding your work <laughs> um, is the thing that actually will set you apart. I think that to be able to be an artist that, um, but not palatable, but to be an artist that is trending, that's all of these things is good, but I really think that being an artist that has depth um, is the thing that will set the work apart. But I, I get the gatekeeping thing. It, it's a real thing, I think, in most industries, but you, you sort of have to do, to do your bit, which is to really ground the work. Hi, um, thank you so much uh, to the speakers who uh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed the conversation. I haven't seen the exhibition yet, but um, my question to the artists, just in terms of the oral histories you've been talking about, um, do you as artists, I know, of course, with our oral histories, there's a lot that depends upon memory, your own and that of the people you speak to, your family. Um, so how important, I guess, is truth within the storytelling for you. Um, Lebohang, I know you mentioned how you use your imagination a lot in your work. Um, so just sort of this idea of truth and perhaps all the gaps that you experience, of course, within your research, um, things you'll never know about. Do you sort of experience grief looking at 
Fenley, um, Albans, um, looking at people who you might never know who they are, and when people pass on sort of those histories go along with them. So how do you engage with that within your own work? Um, I mean, I think the work very much is not trying to, you know, to sort of give the sense of like this ultimate truth. The work is speaking about the fact that within memory, there's like there's elements of imagination and, and um, and fantasy, you know, I think in the same way. So even when I write or think about um, the praise poems or is Tagazelo Diretto, it is also about recognizing there's like, there's a performance element like to it. So there's like a fiction aspect to it. It, it doesn't take away from the history and it doesn't take away from the information that is truthful, that is factual, um, but there is, and that is, I think, the nature of history. Even within the grand narrative of history, there's many, there's many gaps. Um, I mean, also the work is about, I also, don't, I, I also don't wanna say filling in the gap, but it is also about, you know, the family stories that are left, out, that are not part of the grand history of South Africa, the grand history of the story of apartheid. Um, you know, and so I think working with the gaps is what, um, what the work is intentional or acknowledges that it, it does. Yeah, so what I try to do when I interview people is listen very, very carefully. I, I mean, I like to use the exact words. If I'm going to use text at all, I like to be very sure that I'm using an exact quote and that is what they intended to say. Um, I don't make up things about people. Um, I'm not sure if, if yeah. Yeah, but also it's interesting because immediately I thought about your work, Truth Games, um, and how even just that title is very provocative in the sense that you are wondering and kind of reconciling what truth is, right, in all of these kind of stories that have been written about in newspapers and documented and how we've seen them. Um, so that's kind of the one work that came to mind when you asked that question around your practice. Yes. Well, Truth Games is a series in which I've, I've opposed different opposing parties, if, to put it that way, in the Truth and Reconciliation hearings. And I read through, I kept all the newspapers for, for months, and I cut out every single story that of the hearings that were going on. And I tried to present the best case, as it were, for each side. So you might have somebody whose husband had been burned and she would say, you burned my husband. And then the policeman would say, but I was a committed Christian, you know, so I was trying to find the excuses that were made. And then the idea of the truth games, it's, it's each person is trying to get their side of it believed. So that's what that series is about. Okay, unless if there's a burning question or comment, I think this is a good place to end the conversation. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, See, Thank you so much, Lebu. Um, are you available for book signing now or is that later? No, I think it's now. And this is the book. Okay. If anyone wants to have a look to see if they don't want to walk downstairs and have a look at it, it's there. Yes. Thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you so much.